All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome everyone to our webinar uh, for this month. Linux Foundation Public Health is thrilled to be able to host our colleagues from uh, Office of Digital Services at CMS and discussing their uh, open source efforts. Uh, since we have a great and diverse audience uh, today that includes a lot of folks who may not be that familiar with Linux Foundation and Linux Foundation Public Health in particular, I was gonna kick off with a couple slides, uh, set the scene for our activities, what the Linux Foundation is involved in, and most importantly, why it is so exciting to, to get into a synergistic uh, collaboration with CMS as they're pursuing their efforts as well. First thing to provide a little background, Linux Foundation is a 20 plus year old 501c6 membership association of which many of you very well may be familiar or probably running Linux on your desktop and, and the Linux operating system. Uh, but we really have grown around that basis of support to Linux uh, kernel and Linux operating system to a much broader uh, base of international collaboration. As you can see there, we have over 2000 members from 40 plus countries. I myself just got back from our open source summit in the EU where we launched Linux Foundation EU and had uh, hundreds of attendees in Dublin, Ireland for the week across a multitude of topics in which more information is available about that on our website. Uh, we have over 40,000 plus developers contributing code to over 400 plus open source projects. And you can see the list on the right, which I always like to highlight, some of our activities around things like Kubernetes are well understood, Node.js, um, uh, Hyperledger blockchain and others. But we're also growing into industry sector facing sort of activities of which Linux Foundation Public Health is one. You can also see things like uh, uh, the Academy Software Foundation, uh, LF Energy, uh, uh, LF Automotive, where um, uh, functional groups uh, of interest, communities of practice around open source specific to industry efforts are coming together to work with Linux Foundation and Linux Foundation Public Health is, uh, is part of that as well. We were founded in the summer of 2020, and as you would expect, the motivating factor being uh, what ways can open source software and open source uh, uh, tools uh, uh, contribute to our pandemic response. Uh, consequently, we've grown an audience of about 30 plus public health agencies that uh, collaborate with us as stakeholders, and at the same time develop some open source applications in areas such as exposure notification, contact tracing, et cetera. And some of those have continued on over the last two years into version two and version three, uh, and have grown uh, both in their applicability within the US as well as like places such as uh, Ireland and other host countries. And we've continued to build on that momentum to, to, to broaden our focus to areas of digital health and health IT uh, that uh, have seen quite a bit of development work internationally, especially through UNICEF, UNDP, uh, and now a growing presence with WHO uh, and uh, represented by things such as VISTA and the VA and their efforts internally. But to be frank, have quite a lot of opportunity for momentum and potential in the US health IT space, uh, especially serving underserved communities in the same way that focus and attention has been put into LMICs internationally. So very excited to be able to be involved with open source program offices that have come out of WHO. Uh, you can see the webinar from last month and they also presented this month too for uh, our open source summit. Um, obviously featuring uh, CMS today with uh, continuing conversations with VA and other federal agencies, uh, state health information exchanges that are growing increasingly interested in open source solutions, especially around areas like uh, e-consent and data sharing and, and mobile applications. Uh, and with that, uh, I just uh, summarize that we, uh, we provide ecosystems for building open source projects. For those of you in the community that may be familiar with the term digital public goods, which attempts to put frameworks around, uh, if you have something that's open source other than my brother Larry has something at GitHub, but really a governable, sustainable open source project that contributes, these are all key elements to being considered that sort of digital public good, uh, global public good. And they're all facets of exactly what we offer here within the Linux Foundation. So with that as background and context, uh, I am thrilled to turn it over and introduce my colleagues, Andrea Fletcher and Remy de Cosmaker from CMS and talk more about their efforts specifically in advancing uh, open source. Take it away. All right, I think Remy's gonna share his slides. Um, uh, yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah. 
Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Andrea Fletcher. I'm the director of the digital service at CMS. So I'll, I'll give you all a just general overview of who we are and why we're here today. And then I'll let Remy and Alberto dive into um, what CMS is doing around open source technology. Um, so go ahead, Remy, next, next slide. Um, so the three of us who are going to uh, talk today, it's myself, the director of the digital service at CMS. Um, Remy DeCosmaker is our open source lead at the digital service uh, at CMS. And then <laughs> Alberto, uh, is uh, our engineer over at the data, the Office of Enterprise Data and Analytics at CMS, but he's also former US Digital Service. Um, so he's uh, he's been part of our team for, for quite a while now. Um, so the US Digital Service uh, is, is housed in the Office of Management and Budget over at the White House and has, has you know, created digital service teams now across uh, the government. Um, the, big two, the two big agency teams are in Veterans Affairs, the VA, and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, that's us. Uh, and so we're an agency team of the US Digital Service. Uh, we have staff who detail in for four years. Um, and or sorry, who who come on a four year tour of service, mostly from the private sector. We work to transform the US healthcare system um, by you know, having expert designers come in and improve des the design of healthcare experiences. Um, we deliver value to the government, healthcare providers, and patients. Um, we work on modernizing systems. Um, I don't think many of you would be shocked to learn that many government systems are older than I am. Um, and we participate in policy development because a lot of uh, a lot of the big changes that need to happen in um, technology in the in the healthcare system end up being hampered by policy. Um, so we work really by deploying in small teams where we often do some firefighting. We're very responsive teams. Uh, we have designers and engineers and product managers and data scientists who, again, come in on a, a tour of, of duty. So if you're interested in coming into the federal government, um, please look us up. We're always looking for fresh talent. Um, and then we work alongside uh, civil servants. Um, so often we work in like a multidisciplinary team um, to bring new practices and approaches from the private sector into the government. Um, so Alberto is a great example of somebody who was on, in the digital service for a while and is now uh, a full-time uh, employee in the federal government. He's a civil servant, and we work alongside his team um, in, in, in many, many projects in open source. Um, who we serve. So CMS is a, a quite large agency. Um, we serve 62 million Medicare beneficiaries, 88 million Medicaid beneficiaries, um, and then 31 million people get their health insurance through healthcare.gov or the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. So um, a lot of people in the US uh, use our services on a daily basis um, or a yearly basis. Uh, I think the last number I heard was 10,000 people a day sign up for Medicare. So that's primarily people over the age of 65. Um, and that we uh, process about 4.5% of the US GDP through our claims processing for Medicare. So we are a large section of the healthcare system in, in the US. All right, I'll hand it over to uh, Remy and Alberto then, and they're gonna talk about open source and all of the work that we're doing at CMS. So go ahead, Alberto. Welcome, hi, so I'm, I'm Alberto, as Andrea mentioned. Um, I've been around CMS for a few years now, um, and we've been trying to work and improve uh, the use of open source software in the agency. We'll talk a little bit about the history of it too, uh, but just to set the stage, uh, so open source for us, right, and, and for everyone, like means source code that anyone can expect, modify, enhance, and share. And these are key values to the way we want to build solutions and software at CMS, and we're going to work with our partners to do so. And when we talk about open source, um, open source is not just a monolithic community. It's actually a community of communities. And when we think about the open source community at CMS, it starts with sort of the internal kernel of CMS itself, which you know, we have our own enterprise GitHub, we have our own teams, our own tools, our own projects. And then within that center, we are part of the Department of Health and Human Services, which is 
itself inside of the federal government. And then that entire sort of government open source community, um, we share our code then outside with the public. So we share code in places like code.gov and github.com where you can find our projects and our code and the people working on them. And when we think about open source benefits within the CMS environment, uh, typically we're thinking about cost reduction, timelier delivery and improvement of the overall capabilities of a system. And in our policy, which you can read on cms.gov, uh, specifically, we list out benefits such as considerable savings and software purchasing costs and greater efficiency, being able to repurpose and enhance existing software, minimizing vendor lock-in and providing flexibility of choice in our solutions, enabling transparency of software development and supporting extension of software through plugins and other different extension mechanisms that help us to improve the robustness and design and implementation of software. It helps us to increase the productivity through open standards and helps to achieve interoperability across systems and supporting all of that through open collaboration and innovation, having a development community that can exchange ideas and their results and iterate on the work that we're all doing together. And then it also helps us to keep the enterprise abreast of technology development. So facilitating early adoption, working with emerging technology and experimenting with the latest and greatest tools. So a lot of times people talk about sort of myths of open source and uh, not just inside of government, but outside of government as well. Uh, the folks here at the Linux Foundation do a good job of providing some information about uh, open source itself. But when we think about some of these myths, like open source is not less secure and it's not bad for for-profit businesses. And it doesn't mean that all your data needs to be public. And it's something that we already are doing in federal government. Um, open source is more secure because many eyes make any bug shallow. Uh, I believe that's known as Linus's law. And I figured in an LF presentation, it's a good one to shout out. Uh, but the idea is that uh, the more people that look at a project, the faster we will be able to identify problems and create solutions. So fail early and fail often because failure is inevitable and we all learn when we work together. It's good for business because it helps to lower the barriers to entry and the costs of acquisition because developers are given access to world-class industry-leading tools and infrastructure used at the largest enterprises today. Uh, Open source doesn't mean everything has to be public. It means that some things can be public. Open source is not a binary, it is a spectrum. And there are many layers to the stack. So being intentional about what we cannot share for privacy and security purposes helps us determine what we can easily share more effectively. And lastly, open by default is something we do in the federal government. According to title 17 of the US code sections 101 and 105, Copyright protection is not available for work of United States government employees doing part of their official duties. So by default, uh, unless there's another reason for it for security or privacy purposes or contracting purposes, you know, we are encouraged and permitted to share our work openly where we can. So now I wanna turn it back over to Alberto to talk a little bit about the state of open source at CMS today. Thanks, Remy. So the work that Remy and others at the centers of Medicare. Okay. Uh, so the work that others, uh, the Remy and others at the centers for Medicare have been doing stands upon the shoulders of giants. For the past 20 years, a long line of unsung heroes have been pushing for the adoption and the creation of open source software projects in the federal government. So there is more than what we can fit on a single slide. I think we should move to the next slide. Um, there we go, so, uh, so there's more than what we can fit on a single slide, uh, but we wanna highlight what we consider some key moments in the longstanding relationship that the federal government has had with open source software. So there have been a key uh, series of events uh, that we can like start between the 1999 and 2001, when for the first time, this new concept of open source software uh, was considered and its potential use for heightened computing and national security systems was started to be thought out by the federal government. During that same time, uh, in the year 2000, the National Security Agency released Security in Hand Linux, which became a key security component of many Linux distributions to this day. 
the next 12 years from 2003 to 2014 have been followed by more robust policy documents across some notable federal agencies. One agency that stands out has been the Department of Defense. Uh, in 2003, the Department of Defense released the first agency-wide guidance on open source. That was then followed by more clarifying guidance regarding the procurement of services using open source software and services. This served like a, learn, a great learning experience and an example for many other agencies to follow. Then in 2009, a key moment happened, like the first CIO and CTO of the United States were appointed by President Obama. From that point forward, we could say that the adoption of open source software in the federal government like really streamlined. In 2011, the White House published the Open Government Plan for the United States, which was then modified in 2014 to include the goal of drafting and adopting a government-wide open source policy. At the same time, some key agencies started doing very important foundational work. We could mention some of them, like there's like many more, but like the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the General Services Administration and ATF, they created their own agency policies to simplify and structure the adoption of open source software. All of these experiences and policy developments and like a lot of like partners and key players within the federal government helped framing what then became the federal open source policy which was published in August 1st of 2016. Next slide, please. So CMS has also been impacted by all these developments in the use and adoption of open source software. Today, CMS is an avid user of open source software. CMS has a series of application programming interfaces or APIs as we generally call them that use open source software to improve the lives of Medicare recipients. Not only that, these APIs are also developed in the open and can be used by other partners as reference implementations. So they could learn from them or they could use them to bootstrap their efforts and avoid starting from scratch. Some of these APIs at CMS uh, that we can mention are the Blue Button API that empowers Medicare recipients and puts them in control of their Medicare data, the Beneficiary Claims Data API, that allows organizations participating in alternative payment models or value-based care models, as we usually call them, to better serve their Medicare populations. We also have data at the point of care that tries to get the patient's data as close as possible to their doctors in the point of care. Imagine a world where like with less forms to complete every time you go to your doctor. And then you have, we have AB2D, um, which shares, allows sharing claims data with Medicare Part D plans to improve care coordination and medication use. These are just a few examples, like there's many other projects and APIs at CMS that have been adopting open source practices. But I think it's fair to say that now we're looking to mature these open source practices within the agency um, and improve our projects. Next slide, please. So speaking of timelines, uh, this is a little timeline in the development of these APIs that I just mentioned. Um, so in 2018, CMS launched the Blue Button 2.0 API. It's called 2.0 because prior to that, you could only download a gigantic PDF to export your health data from CMS. As you all know, PDFs are not really computer readable. So the Blue Button API allowed for the first time access to Medicare data using open standards like the FAST Healthcare Interoperability Resources or FHIR. The next four years were followed by many of the APIs, the ones that I mentioned, um, which look to improve the healthcare journey of our Medicare recipients. But in addition to these APIs, there have also been some notable policy developments at CMS and the US Department of Health and Human Services. In December, 2021, CMS released the interoperability and prior authorization rule. Um, sorry, in May, 2020, CMS finalized the interoperability and patient access rule, which set the stage for many key players in our healthcare ecosystem about the tools and systems that they needed to build and provide to the beneficiaries to improve their healthcare experience. Next slide, please. But again, this is not only about just the code and the software. Um, we at CMS, and I, I, I speak for Andrea and the team, like we're only successful using open source software when we keep Medicare recipients at the center, right? And it's not only Medicare recipients. We are also looking to improve the experience of providers and doctors with the patients, looking to scale into accountable care organizations, think of population, hospital groups, and also 
with insurance plans because they're also a key player in our healthcare ecosystem. Next slide, please. And then for CMS, this is not about just only open source, right? Um, as I just said, it's, it's about the big picture. And for us, this big picture, uh, keeping the beneficiaries, the Medicare patients, and all these key players in the healthcare ecosystem at the center, right? Really involve using open source and open standards. We know that using these two things together is the only way we can be, build more interoperable systems, like systems that connect with each other and allow a better experience and allow key players to build and improve the experience of Medicare patients at, the, at everywhere they are. With this, I'll hand it back to Remy. Thank you, Alberto, for giving us a little bit of history. Um, you can find all those APIs and open source projects that Alberto was talking about at github.com slash cms.gov or cms.gov if you want to check out more info. But moving away from repos and APIs and timelines, um, we mentioned that one of the things that we help out with is policy here at CMS. So it wouldn't be a government presentation if we didn't go over the government policy, right? So here we're looking at a screen that has the recommended inbound policies that we look at when we're inbounding or you know using open source software from the community inside of the agency. And there's a sort of four different processes that we look at as lenses through which we evaluate. The first one is, you know, are there CMS approved commercial off the shelf products that serve the same purpose as the OSS or vice versa? And then we look at the three sort of axes of maturity, cost and risks and licensing. So when we think about whether a project is mature or not, we're asking questions like, what's the market share and rate of adoption? Is it credible? What is their position of the project within structured bodies and organizations? Is there documentation in books, instruction manuals, and comprehensive and readily available information for the projects? Is there an active community behind the open source software? What's the composition like? Does the project routinely use source code, uh, quality standards, and security standards to you know, understand whether or not the code is well documented? How often are they changing the code? How often are they cutting releases? Is there a process for bug and vulnerability tracking? And is there a way to quickly send patches and resolve them if there are any issues? And when we think about costs and risks, we're looking at things like how well does it integrate with the environment? Is there a talent pool that has the right resources to support development and maintenance of the open source software? Are there any security policies, whether at the agency level or at the federal government level, that might prohibit the use of the software or allow us to you know, integrate it with other systems? Are there professional services available? Is there a third party vendor that can help to support or customize, integrate or operate, maybe even maintain the open source software? And what is the cost of using and maintaining it compared to just grabbing something off the shelf and using it? And lastly, you know, open source also is about licenses. So which licenses are we using or does the project use and do they limit redistribution or are there any restrictions on them? So also in the policy, there are uh, recommended practices for outbound code, that is code that CMS is sharing with the world. Uh, RPOSS-1, if you want to get technical, talks about uh, providing ample documentation. So a lot of the things that we just said, you know, is there, you know, documentation about the project's mission, philosophy, goals, design, decision making? Is there a roadmap? Are there instructions on how to submit issues and pull requests and how to contribute? Um, those are the same kinds of information that if we expect it, then we should provide it as well. And then RPOSS2 talks a lot about using the tools that support community around CMS rel released projects. So, you know, are we using mailing lists and messaging forums and version control? Is there a place to track the project and manage it, such as like Kanban boards or other places where we can work in the open? Um, GitHub gets a specific shout out because there was Kanban boards, but this, you know, there any project management tool or system is a recommended. So um, beyond sort of the recommended practices, you know, there are industry best practices that we hope 
and encourage our projects to follow, such as adopting decentralized governance and defining your team and their roles so that it's clear who in the project is supporting what, and then staffing those roles so that active user engagement and roadmap development and contribution merges can happen on a regular basis. And then finally, uh, promoting active contributors to committer status so that they you know, there's equity involved and the people who are users are also developing into maintainers and contributors and leaders within the project. So if those are the benefits, then what are the sort of things that keep us up at night? What are the actual risks then in open source? And it's not the myths that we talked about before. There's sort of three categories, uh, over differentiation, proliferation, and fragmentation. So over differentiation is or unnecessarily duplicating your work or unnecessarily dividing your resources. A good example of this is not invented here syndrome, where maybe an uh, agency or a project or a company, you know, thinking very silo and says, well, if we didn't build that ourselves, then how do we know if we can trust it or not? Um, those kinds of questions or just saying, hey, we need a thing, let's just build it instead of looking out in the community and seeing what's out there. You can save yourself a lot of time and resources if you're willing to use industry best practices and some of the best code that's out there. Every line of code that you can depend on is a line of code that you don't need to write yourself. So proliferation is the idea of unnecessarily duplicating communities and projects and unnecessarily dividing your addressable market. So some examples of this are like license proliferation or conference proliferation or event proliferation. Um, the more options that are out there within a community contribute to, the less addressable market there is to contribute back to that project. So dividing up your community into lots of pieces uh, means that there are less people available to work together. And that same idea also works in fragmentation as well. So examples of that are things like hostile forks or internal forks. So maybe there's lots of different options with different communities, but you can also divide your existing community into sub communities. Um, internal forks are a great example of this, where if you have an upstream project that's your public repo, but internally you're maintaining a fork that's out of sync, um, you can quickly divide your developer team into sort of two streams and make it so that you're spending, you know, half as much time as you could be as in if you were working in the open. So these are the three things that sort of keep me up at night as an open source lead that I have seen sort of play out, not just in government spaces, but in the private sector and everywhere else. So let's talk about the future. The Linux Foundation recently, uh, maybe a month or two ago, published this deep dive into open source program offices, which is a really in-depth document that I suggest folks take a look at. We pulled some core pieces out of this to discuss today in our presentation. And one of them that I really liked, that we really liked, is this four core stages of open source strategy. So it starts from left to right, and you start off as a consumer. Maybe you're just using a library or a project, and then maybe you notice that there's some kind of issue with it or there's some feature that you would like to see. So you might maybe suggest something on the mailing list or file an issue on the repository. And then before you know it, your engineers might actually be contributing bug fixes and working on that project and helping out. And then after a while, maybe after you're contributing a lot, uh, you start to lead some of those meetings and join committees. And before you know it, you might be leading an open source community. And that four core stages of working at the project level also applies to working at the ecosystem level and the community level. And it's just a great metaphor for sort of the contributor pipeline and how things develop in the open source world. So challenges that open source program offices often face are in things like culture or process, tools, continuity, and education. So how do we deal with challenges like that when they surface? Well, there's a whole buffet of options. And rather than reading all of them out loud, I can just highlight a few. Um, in the education space, providing guidance on licenses and coaching and mentorship, as well as you know, putting that into some kind of new employee orientation, is a great way to help to make sure that engineers are all on the same page and other contributors are on the same page about open source policy. There are a lot of tools that come into play, like 
doing repository analysis and providing metrics, doing linting on repositories and providing templates to people so they can start from something that complies with policies rather than giving them a giant book to read and then having them have to figure it out from scratch every time. Just like it's great for us to use upstream code that we need to have to you know save ourselves work you can do the same thing for your internal community and then you know having an inventory management system for software and understanding where it all exists and who owns it and how we work on it and that is all buttressed by policy so you know how do we get people helping to contribute upstream and what's it like if somebody finds a bug or a vulnerability within our projects and how do they disclose that responsibly and if there's any issues within the community that are violating our values is there a code of conduct that we can point at and an incident reaction policy that we can point to to help mitigate and address those concerns and so once you've got education and tools and process a good way to help to disseminate it is to communicate it. And that means internally in a portal for your employees, but also externally with the community. And that's a tool that helps with visibility for projects, recruiting and developers, and just getting the word out about your projects. And, you know, places like conferences and publishing and papers and academic journals and other open access journals, um, mailing lists, you know, these are great ways to get the word out about your project. But Beyond just you know, having these tools and policies in place, continuity is a big piece of it. And as an open source lead, uh, my first job is to obsolete myself actually, is to make sure that I am not the single point of failure for a community because a community of one is not a very robust or resilient community. So helping to define what a succession plan looks like, helping to provide governance models that include include ways for people to share authority and share responsibility, having onboarding documentation so that whoever follows after you can sort of not have to learn everything themselves from the from scratch. And then my favorite thing is automating manual workflows. So there is a ton of work that has to be done by people, and there are not enough people to do all of the work in open source, whether you're in the government or whether you're in the private sector, that's just the reality of dealing with software. So automating that work as best as we can really helps to make it easier for the community to thrive. And Remy, one more I'd add on to that too, and you may have been in there, I just missed it as I looked at that comprehensive list, but training and certification. You know, we, we, uh, we've built training and certification programs that have largely grown out because as those programs and those uh, OSPO efforts, just as you delineated there, um, thrive and start to develop, these community led efforts around specific projects realize, hey, now we need to have training on how to use and implement these, these open source projects. And moreover, some of them like, you know, Kubernetes and other cloud certification security lend themselves to uh, certifiable education tracks too. Yep. The last item in the education list, we mentioned professional, professional developer training. Um, and within the government itself there are communities of practices um alberto actually leads our api community of practice and helped to start the fire community of practice so you know there are internal uh resources for education but you know we're always looking for best practices and ready-made resources to share with the government so that we can bring those industry best practices back into our work thank you for sharing that jim so that's sort of the buffet of stuff. So what might it look like uh, if we were gonna try and figure out how to build an open source program or office inside of uh, CMS? And you know, this is what, you know, going through quarter one of 2024, you know, maybe we start by hiring a lead, do some pilots, gather some metrics, present at this Linux Foundation public health webinar thing maybe. And then as we move into future quarters, you know, how do we manage inquiries from within our agency for help and uh, support within open source projects, reviewing various policies on open source and bug bounties and community code of conduct, helping to internally share the fact that we have an open source program and we're building an office and that we are here to help doing things like roadshows and talking with other folks inside of the agency. And then also uh, starting recruiting for 2023. Uh, there's a program called Digital Core, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. But uh, the idea is, is if we're at the digital service doing four-year tours of duty, 
There's another program called Digital Core that allows uh, early career technologists to get a two-year tour of duty, as well as some recruiting bonuses uh, to come in and sign up to work at agencies doing work uh, in this space. And at the end of it, they have a full-time job waiting for them. Uh, it is a really effective program. It just started this year and we have two amazing fellows, shout out to Chizo and Michelle, who have been doing amazing work helping all over the agency, but especially with our open source efforts. So um, beyond growing the people and interviewing for the next season, you know, automating things through things like GitHub Actions, getting our linters out there, defining our best practices and guidelines, creating checklists for inbound and outbound projects. And then once we've got some of those baseline tools in place, let's start developing some of that training. Let's get that new employee orientation out there and continue interviewing some of these candidates that are coming through. And then once they get here, you know, we can do an inventory of all the repositories that we have and start looking at defining all the places and looking at the metrics that we've been gathering to figure out where we can do the most work that does the most good. And then start doing rotations on that work to start chunking through and breaking down the backlog and getting things done. And then, you know, maybe we build a portal where we talk about all of this work and we have our inventory and our recruiting begins for the next season. And then by then, maybe we'll have a great story to tell and we'll publish some kind of portal on the outside. Um, again, this is an aspirational roadmap. So uh, we are going to be subject to change. And as the world changes, as you know, sometimes uh, there are major laws that get passed or public health crises that emerge. So uh, we as a team, we value nimbleness and adaptivity so we can change course and move forward as needed. But this is a good place to start from. So how to get involved. Uh, we already mentioned uh, some of these programs, but here at the digital service, if you want to join up, uh, it's a four year tour of duty. We have engineers, product managers, designers, and data scientists. Uh, we work off of the, the GS scale, which you can check out on the internet. Uh, that talks about sort of tells you right off the bat sort of what your salary ranges look like. Uh, GS 13 is sort of where uh, typical digital service begins and you can go to cms.gov slash digital dash service dash CMS to check out our team. Uh, the digital core, which I mentioned already is a two year tour of duty fellowship for early career technologists. Uh, you start at GS nine and you move to GS up to GS 12 through the thing. Uh, through the program as it progresses, and there's a 50% recruitment incentive if you join up. Uh, digitalcore.gsa.gov for more information there. And then for folks who are not yet out of school or earlier on in their career than that, there's also a paid 10-week summer internship with the Coding It Forward fellows that also do placements at public agencies and local governments and state governments, as well as federal government, uh, so that you can do uh, the same kind of civic hacking and digital transformation work that happens at Digital Core and Digital Service earlier on in your career. So uh, this is the part where if anybody has any questions, uh, these are the places where you can reach us. Uh, again, Digital Service, you can see the URL cms.gov slash digital dash service dash CMS, digitalcore.gsa.gov for the Digital Core Fellowships, and codingitforward.com for the internship program. And I will open it back up to the panelists and our moderators who do Q&A. Thank you so much, Remy and Andrea and Alberto. I think that was an excellent overview. Uh, now is the time to leverage that Q&A. We do have a couple of questions I'll dive into in here in just a sec, but uh, feel free to, to jump in and add what you like. Uh, Remy, one question I kind of had back is, uh, and I think you're alluding to some of this laying the groundwork, especially with that last slide, but do you have a short term vision on a specific call for code from the community, either at a project level or, or just in general? Uh, and are you targeting any hackathons uh, uh, for consideration in, in FY23? That's an excellent question. And uh, even though we just got started uh, in earnest, we are planning on participating in Hacktoberfest this year. So uh, we're doing our Preptober or Preptember kickoff right now with the API community of practice. And we are starting to engage with some of our uh, hosted open source projects at the agency to get them to 
groom their backlogs, add Hacktoberfest topics, and put some good first issues out there and be prepared for contributions to come in from the community. So we're going to be doing some internal work. Uh, you can go to hacktoberfest.com to see the rules for participation. It's a worldwide uh, celebration of open source that is supported by DigitalOcean and a few other sponsors. But the idea is, is that uh, if you get four pull requests accepted into a project, um, you you have successfully participated and a certain number of people will either get t-shirts or get a tree planted uh, in their as a sort of reward and thank you. But really the big reward I believe is the increased participation. I think last year over 140,000 uh, pull requests were submitted over the month of October. So that is a huge amount of effort to help close up a lot of issues. And um, so that's just one example of the kinds of things we're hoping to do. I think I'll open to tell Berto maybe and see if he has any other suggestions about engaging with some of the specific projects that we have. I think there was a question also about fire. Um, so I guess we try to connect with different communities, right, and work with them. For example, we closely work with the fast helper, the fire community, right? Um, especially from the blue button perspective, we, uh, our team uh, here at CMS has been closely involved uh, with the current group alliance, like trying to uh, working on the development of the implementation guide for data sharing for uh, Medicare data claims data. So. Like those are avenues where people can collaborate with us and with other key partners within the ecosystem. Um, and again, like there's many projects, uh, our APIs, if you go to developer.cms.gov, uh, you will see the link to the APIs that I mentioned and a few others, and they will point you to GitHub repos and other resources that could be like a way to connect with us and contribute if, if that's like really a possibility. Um, I guess like we are looking and thinking of like open sourcing certain tools to improve the adoption of, of our APIs, right? So at some point as those actually mature, uh, it may be possible that those are uh, clear spaces where partners can contribute to them. Excellent, hand in hand with that, I've got a, another question in here and I think that this slide gives those resources, but they're asking about recommendations for government employees that wanna start getting involved in open source projects. Um, I'm afraid specifically in the question, I don't know which agency they might be, but whether it's CMS or another agency uh, outside of HHS, others uh, that want to get involved, I assume they can look to their resources on this slide. Yep. And go ahead, Andrea. Yeah, um, I, I'm just looking at some of the questions about contractors and employees, and, and it's amazing how many people want want to get involved and support the work. I think that's one of the main reasons we're we're trying to get ourselves a little bit better organized at CMS, um, and why why Remy is you know our new open source lead, and 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 we're figuring out ways that we can, I guess, better document and support um, onboarding of of people who are interested. Um, I'll, I'll just answer a couple of these. I, I'm trying to type in the answers as well as I'm looking at them. Um, you know, anybody in the federal government, federal employees are allowed to apply to digital service. We do hire people who are experts in procurement or policy. We try to look for specifically for um, technical policy. We, we call these people bureaucracy navigators or bureaucracy hackers, um, right? Because there's clearly a lot of policy implications. And I know some things have come up like ATO or authorization to operate or Fed ramping processes, which have been kind of a, a burden or um, have hindered open source development in the past because these are really long and lengthy processes in order for us to get software authorized to operate in the government. Um, you can't just, you know, uh, take something out of a box and, and open it up and, and put it into the government. It doesn't really work that way. Um, and these are these are great questions because you know this is part of why we we need to have a team at, within the federal government within our agency who are are able to answer these questions quickly and write the policy and the FAQs of how we get this done and how we move how we navigate and move through the government um, because it's not always easy. Um, and that's and that's kind of why we're here is to start figuring some of that out and and remove those road blockers. I mean, I would add um, every time Remy and I sit down to talk about open source and dream, uh, we're like sharing links that we find on the internet, right? Like we're like kind of like in the very open source period, like trying to avoid reinventing the wheel when possible. Uh, so I would say there's like many great examples of like policies that people could use and point their agencies to say, hey. This is not something 
weird. <laughs> uh, like the DOD has been doing this. Um, GSA has a open source policy. Um, 18F, right? And those are clear examples that people can point their like stakeholders and key partners to basically engage in the conversation um, and start using open source software. Yep. And specifically, GSA has helped to develop a website called code.gov. And code.gov is a place where you can look at source code repositories where agencies can add metadata to their repos so that they show up within the wider ecosystem of open source. Um, that's a good resource. I would also throw out there that 18F has published a series of guides. Um, I can't remember the URL off the top of my head right now, but they have a, a design methods guide and an agile development guide and an engineering guide. And these are public on the internet. And we at CMS, I at least have definitely been cribbing off of those and speaking with our colleagues there. Um, I think it's really cool when you look at the open source policies and it's like GSA forked 18F's policy, which was forked from CFPB's policy. And, you know, lots of folks in the government are trying their best to not reinvent the wheel and build off of best practices where we can. Um, speaking of like that FedRAMP stuff, uh, there's actually an organization within CMS that, you know, our cloud architects have been working on. It's called the Bat Cave, and it is out there to sort of provide an implicit ATO to ADOs, so an authorization to operate to application development organizations. If I'm learning my acronyms correctly, I'm still pretty new at the post. You're but, doing great. <laughs> yep. So the idea is, is that if we can get frameworks and hosted solutions that are industry best practices approved and they are managed with a team, then in theory, people who are developing applications on top of those shouldn't have to fed ramp them separately. And we are learning uh, as we are going through the digital transformation and making cloud and zero trust, which is another initiative that has been getting a lot of uh, attention inside and outside of the government. Uh, we're getting better at these things. They're not, we're not there yet. And there's always room for improvement. But, you know, as someone who recently joined, I've actually been pretty impressed with some of the initiatives to try and get through some of those, like, to convert, to address some of those issues around onboarding and approval. I would also add, Remy, that we, I mean, at least at CMS right now, we don't kind of like fed RAM on approve like a project or a tool. Um, we authorize like the complete project, right? Like that it's composed by different tools that some of them may be open source or custom developed in-house, right? Uh, so that is the way the agency kind of approaches that. And that like changes the way and the thought process because like when you look at the controls, like at, a, like at the big picture level of the system, uh, you don't need to go through like the nuance and the burden of like going project by project and try to make sure that it is fed around. This is also like, I mean, if it's like software as a service, like that has a different process uh, within the agency. Uh, but generally we don't fed RAM or approve like specific tools or projects. Um, and also right. I want to make a call out for the digital services playbook uh, that was published by yes. USDS and, and the office of the uh, federal CIO. Um, because it, uh, I forgot, I think eight, um, I can't remember from the top of my head, but like one of the place actually talks about um, using like open tools, uh, open source tools, building in the open and all these like values that like very clearly align with open source. Um, so the way that like modernizations and new projects are tackled like in many agencies uh, is like using the digital services uh, playbook as kind of the framework. So you can also point to like those policies that exist, the playbook and all these things holistically to say like, hey, you know, th there's, there's like a clear path for organizations uh, and for government agencies to like use open source. Yeah, and Alberto, I was just gonna add to that. I think uh, this, this also harkens back to what we were talking about just before the webinar, which is the difference between the repositories and the projects and actually having reference implementations, reference architectures living someplace in a dev and a test that would have to meet those ATO requirements. So I think I, I see where there's, there's pretty clear delineations between the lifecycle management of the project itself and then how that gets implemented as a reference implementation that would have to meet all of the ATO, FedRAMP specific compliance for, for a SaaS product and that sort of thing. So. so 
I see a question in here in the Q&A about uh, from Britta that says, is there a documented policy or process for adopting or forking existing open source projects as a starting point for custom projects at CMS? So this is a great question. Um, there are reference implementations, I guess you could say, right? Like we can point at some of the blue button and other APIs that Alberto has mentioned as sort of like, here's the latest iteration of what an open source project at CMS looks like. But uh, one of the early projects within an open source program or open source program office is to provide repository templates themselves. And that kind of guidance that says like, you can start by forking this blank repo or a template. And in previous open source programs that I've led at other you know, publicly traded companies, uh, we develop things like a repo scaffolding repo, which is a, it provides Python tools like cookie cutter that will just ask you some questions like, what's your URL for your project and where do the docs live? And you know, whose email is like the project lead, and then it will automatically generate a lot of those documents in the repo for you so that you can start not from scratch, but from something that will meet the requirements. And that is an early project that we're currently working on it is not ready for prime time yet. But I would definitely encourage you to check out repo scaffolding on GitHub. Uh, there's probably a few different repos that uh, have been forked and used in production at places that have open source programs. And I would add to what Remy just said that I guess our dream at CMS, and this is something that Remy and I talk about a lot, uh, is um, like get to a place where all those reference implementations at CMS like are following the best practices, right? Um, so it is like very clear and easy for uh, any other partner or like anyone in the public to like use our projects and fork them if possible, right? Um, there's like group for improvement, and this is uh, why you know there's a great momentum with Remy and others in the agency to like actually like moving to that path. Yeah, and I noticed one more question too in the chat that I speak I think was speaking a bit to what you said, Remy, about, uh, hey, my agency could open source some of the projects we have, but what are some of the first steps to um, be in our own OSPO or managing these open source projects? I know you've laid out a lot of both the existing government publications as well as the what you're focusing on in CMS, uh, you know, are there are one or two quick things they can look at to start and I think cultivate that conversation and maybe develop that sort of OSPO roadmap for agencies? Yeah, um, we're still pretty early on in our journey. Um, this is definitely the kind of guidance that I would love to provide. I think that um, as Alberto mentioned before, the playbook that was developed by the CIO and the GSA has some guidance in there about managing open source projects and communities. There are a lot of community resources out there as well that come from the world outside of government that still apply. Uh, Linux Foundation happens to host a bunch of projects that talk specifically about this. Uh, I've served on the steering committee of something called the to-do group, which is the like aggregation conglomeration or sort of community for open source program offices uh, inside of industry. So the to-do group publishes lots of guides. Some of them are around how to market your open source project, how to manage your communities, how to deal with continuity, how to use tools, how to do all types of stuff. So definitely check out the to-do group for information about starting OSPO, starting open source program offices, doing some of the work of an open source program office, different ways you can create them if you don't have the resources to create an official OSPO, how to get started. There's a Slack community you can join where you can talk to people who run open source programs. Um, Todo has been a, a really vital resource in a variety of open source program offices and programs that I've gotten to work with and create throughout my career. So big shout out to LF and Todo Group for providing those resources. Yeah, thank you, Remy, and I apologize. I didn't, wasn't able to coordinate with uh, Anna Jimenez, who's the executive director for To Do Group, but uh, I did have her on during the uh, WHO OSPO presentation. Uh, and I have put links into the chat for everyone uh, on both the To Do Group website and their GitHub repo that has you know all of that great stuff in it. No doubt they're doing some some excellent work. So, yep. Open source.guide and open source.dev is another uh, website, I believe Google published that really goes into some 101 level TLDR, like what is a community, how does it work, what are licenses. So those are two great jump off points that you can start from. 
Uh, absolutely. And I would just throw out for anyone who views this webinar or sees the recording, uh, you can use the links or the info at, uh, at lfph.io off of our website uh, uh, to send an inquiry in. Happy to connect you up, add you to the Slack channel, etc. Uh, there's a question specifically on types of licenses that government projects use. And I think, Remy, that much like ourselves, that you, uh, from an open standpoint, uh, GPL, AGPL, MIT, Apache 2, we certainly prefer Apache 2 for most of our open projects, but wonder to love, would love your thoughts too. So. Yeah. So let me start by answering this question with a standard disclaimer, which is, I am not a lawyer and this does not constitute legal or financial mm -hmm. advice. Uh, as far as... Uh, I'm a pluralist and it really depends on what the goals of your projects are and what the culture is around the decisions you make for the technologies you choose. So different communities prefer or lean towards different types of licenses. So in the world of JavaScript, you might see different licenses than in the world of C++ in the world versus the world of Python. Um, I think that's a, a really sort of lawyerly answer would be it depends and you should sort of do your homework and ask yourself some questions about what your goals are. Um, as far as government projects, um, the standard approach right now, at least that I see when I look at open source policies from places like GSA and 18F is uh, CC0 and public domain. Uh, it seems to be one of the more popular licenses that is chosen for open source projects. Um, this is a question that I am interested in, you know, exploring and learning more about and working with legal experts inside and outside of the agency to determine. Um, I think that as the world of software intellectual property has changed over the last 20 years, this question continues to come up. And as new licenses are created, uh, we have new answers and even more questions to answer. So uh, very sort of, it depends. Most people default to CC0, uh, but this is a question that I look forward to exploring more in my post. Excellent. And one last question, which I think is a pretty good one that someone submitted anonymously. Are you using GitLab to support uh, some of the CI, CD, and security aspects of it? Um, I don't think we touched upon that yet. So. Yes. Uh, Alberto, maybe you can speak better to this. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's many options like very pluralist as Ray was saying like as the um so there's a mix of things like some teams use uh gitlab internally uh and they do some of these like vulnerability scanning and stuff um some there's like many teams using a uh, public github and they have like either like github actions or some other tool to do like their ci cd pipeline and like all these like security scanning and stuff um and there's also like uh internal Enterprise GitHub, <laughs> which is used for a few other projects. Um, I, I think that's the less mature in terms of um, how much like continuous integration and continuous uh, deployment and delivery we have. Uh, but like, there's many options, right? Um, I guess like CMS is trying to get to a point where like there's a set of options that are pretty solid and basically reduce the burden for organizations so they can actually focus on delivering value and serving the customers, right? Instead of like having to manage once and again, uh, all these components. But there's like elements of that. And many of the ATO processes and controls will like ask that you do some kind of like vulnerability scanning and that you follow certain practices that align with those tools. I wanna make a quick shout out for the Software Heritage Project. I actually shared a panel last uh, month with uh, Roberto, uh, who is uh, working with the French government on their open government plan, and they use that project to host all of their source code in a distributed way that is trying to solve this problem at scale for the planet. They actually got digital public good uh, endorsement from uh, UNICEF as a cultural heritage project. So uh, hopefully that those examples out in the international world, um, maybe we can look to within our work at the national level you know, open standards and open source are all about looking at best practices. And I know that Andrea has done a lot of work in the open source world and her international development. And we're really lucky to have international experts like her leading the digital core here and the digital service. Oh, thanks, Remy. <laughs> Great plug. 
<laughs> Fantastic. Uh, with that note, we are at time. And uh, again, thank you very much, Andrea, Remy, and, uh, and Alberto. I think this has been an excellent um, peek inside the world of your developing open source efforts. Obviously, the Linux Foundation is very excited to be able to collaborate with you. Thank you to everyone who attended today. We will have this webinar uh, up to our website, uh, I think, within the next uh, two business days. Uh, always available for, for recording there, or you may go to info at lfph.io and request additional information. We'll be happy to follow up with you. And let's see if we can get a uh, federal health uh, open source community of practice rolling. Thank you again, everyone, and uh, have a great rest of your week. Bye.